Hello, hello. Oh, I should check that every time. I don't know why, but OBS does not seem to remember um, what I set. It should. Okay. Now we've got audio, or we should have audio. Now it takes quite a bit of time. I'm actually talking about a minute ahead of uh, when it comes up. Let me see what I've got on this. Hello, hello, okay, so we've got some there. Some audio, yeah, we've got audio. Okay, we've got audio everywhere we need it. And thank you for letting me know about that. Um, I think we have audio now that's better. Okay. Everywhere says that's better. Okay, and then there was sound. <laughs> YouTube. I had an up, upstream bit rate of 3,800 bits per second. And uh, YouTube came back at we, me with an error and um, said that they wanted to see 69 or 6,800 bits per second. So I went ahead and changed it in um, OBS. So you tell me if the picture is any clearer or um, whatever. I don't know what, what the thing's looking for. So um, what I was saying when it just looked like I was talking to myself is uh, my upper gum is almost back to the point where I can put my upper dentures in and sound like myself again. Right now, um, I am down to one and three quarters natural teeth. And um, I've got one really sturdy one here, and then I've got this one in the back that's cracking and falling apart and so I think about a quarter of it has fallen out. So they're going to remove that in a week or so. Um, what they want me to do is have my one remaining good tooth taken out so they can put a full denture up there. And I'd have to hold it in with the polydent because I don't want to pay the $10,000 required to get the implants in there that would hold it in place. I don't have the $10,000 to do that. So, um, I do have a partial, and the partial will do, and that I can hold in with polydent, so I think I'm going to do that to save the $10,000 that they want for that. It is crazy. Okay, let's go back to the beginning here. Um, Leo, thank you for checking in. Uh, appreciate that. Let's see... Um, he says, uh, how great are ferrite rings? Put one on my feed line and boom, noise diminished nearly to zero. Signal still strong and more intelligible. Isn't it nice when you only receive what's inside the coax? The other stuff, the outside of your coax, which is separate, I mean, it's the same piece of metal, I know, but the skin effect applies. So inside the coax, you have the center conductor and you have the inside of the shield uh, because of the, the skin effect. But the outside of the shield between your antenna and your, your ground acts as an antenna too. And the radio gets confused as to what it should be using. So if you put the ferrite bead on it, or a series of ferrite beads, you can uh, cause that the impedance on the outside of the coax to suddenly become very high. And so trying to collect it as an antenna is really nowhere for it to go. So that really works. Uh, you can put the ferrite bead up near the antenna if you want. Uh, some people prefer them down closer. Uh, what I do with my antennas is 
uh, they all come down, all the coaxes come to lightning arresters that are uh, bonded to the ground rod very well. And so that way, anything picked up on the outside is grounded out right there so it doesn't come in. And I did an experiment once. I had just put up um, an HF9V. This was quite some time ago. And uh, it had radials there that were grounded. And then I had the 100 foot long coax come directly into my radio and the noise was enormous. So I tried something. <clears throat> I had to add a piece of coax to get it into the shack. And I used a little barrel connector. And let me show you what a barrel connector looks like. Okay, a barrel connector looks like this. I'll hold it up close so you can see it. Uh, barrel connector is two SO239s back to back. You can actually see through it. If I can get that in the right direction, yeah. Okay, these are cheap, dirt cheap at ham fests. And the nice thing about the barrel connector, then I put the two ends, uh, this is how I connected the two pieces of coax. And so I took a hose clamp and clamped this to my, um, to the ground wire that was very near where the ground wire was, and bam, the noise went away. And so I figured out, okay, I just learned something very valuable, and that is if you will ground your um, outer connectors, or outer shields, you can really reduce the noise. And it's a very nice thing. And I would recommend it as a, a matter of uh, normal practice. Okay, so yeah, those ferrite beads can work really well. Anthony Becerra says, Hey Dave, happy Thanksgiving. And happy Thanksgiving to you all. We had a very nice Thanksgiving here. Um, since the kids don't come here on Thanksgiving they're more likely to come over Christmas. Um, my son is 40 and my daughter's 38. So anyway, um, we, my wife and I have taken to going to a local restaurant. There was a place down in Uray that served an outstanding Thanksgiving meal. And it was very standardized. Everybody got the same thing. Uh, they, the owners of the building they were in, booted them out because they wanted something else in there, which is a real shame. Um, but we went up into Montrose to the Stonehouse restaurant, which is, I think, the nicest restaurant up there. Bunch of old people. Boy, I tell you, everybody in there had gray hair. But it was a Thanksgiving buffet, and it was wonderful. Uh, all the normal trimmings, where you could get ham, where you could get prime rib, either way. And uh, just very nicely done. We were pleasantly full. We came home, took naps, and which you always have to do on Thanksgiving. No football. <laughs> so, and then I came into this room and spent quite a bit of time answering emails. I am very badly behind on emails again. So um, if you got an answer today from an email, um, that's good. A number of these emails I printed out. I'm going to start doing a few videos where I will answer a few short questions in series. Uh, all in one video if they are related like antenna or coax or something like that. Um, I also owe the editors at uh, QST um, my February column. 
for us, Dave. So I'm trying to think February at the same time. Thinking November because I'm going to do a November... No, I'm sorry, December. Um, <laughs> I'm not making much sense, am I? Um, I do my column, and then with each column, there is a short video that expands on one of the ideas in there. And in the uh, December QST, I made the statement. Somebody asked about the gain of a cubical quad antenna on HF versus a hex beam. Turns out the cubical quad's a little bit better, but um, I stated in there I did not know of anybody who sold them anymore. Most people sell Yaggies. And uh, so I got several responses from people who said, oh, yes, there are. And they all pointed me to a, um, oh, where to go? This isn't the right group. Too many pieces of paper. Anyway, there is a company that makes them. And um, it's called um, Cubex Quads. C-U-B-E-X. And they do have an active website. They make them for HF and VHF and UHF. And uh, what a cubical quad is, it's very interesting. It's a loop. Okay, a loop antenna, a square, usually, or diamond-shaped, whatever. And then you put a reflector behind it and some directors in front of it, and you turn that loop into a loop Yagi. Except it's not technically a Yagi, it's a series of loops that become a directional antenna. They were, for many years, extremely popular uh, because people could build them themselves using bamboo or something like that that was light that they could get in the air, and then they just had to use wire to make them. Um, and then when more and more people started selling Yagis, um, a lot of people moved to those because... Uh, the Yagi can be can be sturdier in bad weather. One of the problems with the, the cubical quads is uh, freezing rain and wind. And they're massive. And you have to have them on a tower, and you have to have a rotator and all that. Well, um... They kind of lost their popularity. In fact, um, I have not actually seen a cubical quad anywhere in the past 10 or 15 years. But apparently they do exist. And uh, they are on the Cubix Quad webpage. So I'm going to call them probably Monday when they get back to work and uh, see if they're still making them. Because um, uh, the, the emails that I got said that they used to advertise all the time in QST, but their ads have been more sporadic of late. Well, that could be a symbol of probably the owner getting old and cutting back on uh, what he is doing. So, um, and we've seen antenna companies disappear. There used to be the Force 12 antennas, which were very popular with the Xers. And uh, they were made right up the street in Glenwood, or in uh, Grand Junction. And uh, they're no more. And uh, now I know that uh, DX Engineering is picking up some of these smaller companies, like the butternut antennas, are now actually manufactured by DX Engineering. Um, then you have MFJ, which has purchased Cushcraft, High Gain, um, Vectronics, 
the Maritron, and one other that I can't remember. There are five of them. And just moved the operations to uh, Mississippi uh, in Starkville, but not all in the same place. So they're kind of keeping them separate and letting them do their own thing. Um, and MFJ has never made an attempt to, quote, harmonize its product line so it isn't competing with itself. But now, like the, the power supply that I have for my Ameritron, is a 75 amp power supply uh, that used to have an Ameritron brand. It now has an MFJ brand, but it's still sold as an Ameritron. So, you know, what's happening is a lot of consolidation in the industry. I'm sorry, I have a very dry mouth. Um, having teeth out, it's not fun. Um, but like I said, by, I'm thinking tomorrow or Saturday, I will be able to put my dentures back, or upper denture in. I, I have the lower one in. Um, oh, you guys don't want to hear about teeth, although I have a feeling a lot of you have had that issue, you, just because we're an older group. Okay, Anthony Becerra says, um, Happy Thanksgiving, and a happy Thanksgiving to everyone there. Uh, Ralph Leland, hi Dave and everyone, K4TA in Fork Union, Virginia, happy Thanksgiving. Then we go through the uh, sound problem. Lefty says it's cold in Davenport, 38. It's 37 here, 64% humidity. Doug Dry who supplied me with my telephone here, and I still need to persuade him that I'm willing to pay for my monthly service. Um, it does actually work. The phone does work. And uh, it's kind of cool to have this old dial telephone in here that works because, uh, I mean, it actually goes out over the internet. But uh, it's fun to, to show people conversation starter. Okay, um, Chuck Schreiber, good evening, happy Thanksgiving to all. Um, N5KVO from the hill country of South Texas, currently 46. We go through the no audios, yes, now we have some audio. Okay. Um, let's see, here we are. Uh, David, good evening, David, and happy Thanksgiving to everyone. Checking in from the mountains of northeastern Pennsylvania, where it's currently 37 degrees with 70% humidity, which is almost what we have here. Two inches of rain recently. Okay, and Phil, K-A-2-Q-I-K, says happy Thanksgiving to all from Kalamazoo, Michigan. Now, there are a number of viewers who are outside the United States who either don't have an equivalent holiday or have something like it that they separate on another day uh, or just um, do things differently. Like in the UK, they have the so-called bank holidays, which are kind of, the equivalent of our Memorial Day and Labor Day. They're on different days, uh, but it's the same kind of thing, a three-day weekend that's pretty universally celebrated through the country. When I was a kid um, in the United States, we would celebrate holidays on fixed days. You know, July 4th was celebrated on July 4th. But then somebody got the idea that all federal holidays ought to be on Mondays, thus giving people a three-day weekend, several three-day weekends throughout the year, and that was done. And now uh, I think the original meaning of the holidays has long been lost. Um, we used to celebrate Washington's birthday on February I think it was February 12th, and Lincoln's on February 22nd were celebrated separately. And so they combined them into a President's Day, a holiday that's now almost completely forgotten. 
Columbus Day was a big holiday. Now that's Indigenous Peoples Day or something like that. But, you know, what we celebrate changes from time to time. Maybe they we can do something in ham radio where we can have, say, a holiday on Art Collins' birthday uh, or on the day the first Yesu radio was imported to the United States or... Um, you know, a, a ICOM 7300 day. Wouldn't it be nice if we could have holidays like that and have the whole country celebrating something they know nothing about? <laughs> okay. Um, let's see. Uh, Phil, K-A-2-Q-I-K, Happy Thanksgiving to all from Kalamazoo. And uh, Damn Cars says, Hi guys from Subic Bay. Subic Bay, if it's the Subic Bay I'm thinking of, is a naval base in the Philippines that was U.S. for a long time. We gave it back, and now with all the stuff China is up to, we've kind of reactivated that, that base because the Filipinos and Chinese are having direct conflict over some islands and fishing grounds and stuff like that where... Uh, China has just sort of declared what they call the seven line uh, line to be Chinese. And everybody should keep out. And, of course, international law says that you can have a uh, 12-mile zone where your laws apply and a 100 or 200-mile, I think it's a 100-mile economic zone where you have the control over the fishing rights. And, of course, countries that butt up against each other have to draw a line between the two of them. This is mine, this is yours. And, of course, these days, a lot of people are not doing that. So, oh well. Uh, Wayne Stiles, Happy Thanksgiving from Central Pennsylvania. Lefty, no sign language, please. He's left-handed. Ray Aggie... Aguiar, sounds great, from KE4YAF. Uh, Rob Fisher says, looks good. 5 by 9 let's see here. Uh, getting old is an adventure. That's one way of describing it. Um, but soon you'll be so handsome, right? Yeah, I'll have my dentures back. Uh, Mark French, happy Thanksgiving to everybody. Lefty got dental implants 10 years ago, one of the best decisions he's ever made. They've gone way up in price. Now, there's two ways you can get them. What they do is they put a post, a steel or some metal, titanium, I don't know, unobtainium, uh, in your mouth in like three places or four places. And then the gums snap down on these or not the gums, the, the, the uh, teeth, the denture, snaps down on this and then it's held in place, okay? Now, the other way of getting implants is to get all implants for all your teeth. As they fall out, you don't do bridges. You put an implant in, put a tooth on top of that, a, a fake tooth. Uh, you could almost call it a crown, on top of that and eventually you've got all implants <clears throat> and then if one of the implants or if one of the teeth goes bad you can just take it off there and put another one on no more of this drill 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 kind of thing although they might use that to get it off because you've got this post that's embedded into your jaw um, you can do that um, a, a lot of older people go down to Mexico. Um, Los Algodones out of Yuma. It's the northernmost tip of Mexico. And the whole town is built around a two-block area right by the border where every other uh, building is a, a dentist. And then they've got others that are pharmacies. I'm not sure I would fill 
my medications in Mexico because I don't really know what I'm getting. But I have had some dental work done down there and it's vastly less expensive than doing it here. So we'll see. Okay, let's see. Um, a lefty, I'm glad they work for you. Um, Madison County Sound Labs, good evening and the happiest of Thanksgiving, 73 from N1XV. John Bray's, the subtitles, hilarious, fair eyed beads. <laughs> um, Leo, the kit from Palomar for the very size of rings were very affordable. That's good. Um, not anymore, boy. At least not here. Ray Aguiar, Happy Thanksgiving. John Ward, Happy Thanksgiving. Found an icon of a turkey. Warren Baker, good evening. Happy Thanksgiving from Chattanooga. WA4BAK. Um, Digital Panther, happy annual trip to Fan Overdose Day. Everyone, KK6YUR. Phil, KE2QIK. I built a cubicle quad for two meters out of heavy aluminum wire and scrap wood from plans in an old ARRL antenna book. Works surprisingly well. Yes, they do. And if you're going to buy uh, a Yagi and all that sort of stuff, it used to be more expensive than to just build your own cubicle quad. But now you can buy cubicle quads from Cubex, and they're as expensive as Yagi's, yeah. Um, some people just really like them. Uh, Leo says, a few of the old-time makers of those massive antennas still exist, according to another YouTube video I saw only yesterday. Well, good. I'd like to find some more. Arthur Peterson, Happy Thanksgiving from Wasilla, Alaska, KB7FXJ. Bill Myers, KA8GIM, hello Dave and all Augies. Happy Thanksgiving from a cold Wisconsin, 18 degrees here tonight. We're down to 36. Uh, it's supposed to snow like crazy in Colorado tomorrow. We'll see. We were told we'd wake to snow and we woke to sunshine, so... It had clouded over by the time we went into uh, Montrose. Um, Bill Myers, K -A -A -G, uh, 18 degrees, Doug Dry. I will look at the bill from the carrier, Dave, when I get a chance. Doesn't cost much. I just wanted to support the channel. Well, Doug, thank you so much for your support, but I am willing to pay <clears throat> for the service. I mean, I hardly ever use it, but it's fun to have. and. Sometimes it's just nice to use that. Okay, Harry um, Peabody, thanks for everything. Harry UK2, Echo Zero, Oscar, Charlie November. Harry, I think you're, you're new. I don't remember you here before, so welcome, welcome. What we try to do in this weekly get-together is, frankly, just that, get-together. And... Um, uh, we talk with each other via the comments. I've got a thing I want to talk about here about noise issues, maybe a little later on. We also have a drawing every month, which occurs on the first uh, live stream of the month for the previous month. The um, prize is a uh, two meter radio, two meter 70 centimeter radio from Redivus that I tested and found to be a rather good radio. And it was really interesting. I mean, this is definitely somebody in marketing doing something. They had a sale on a six pack of these radios. And, I, and, with, and originally they had one large six socket charger for them. And I said, this isn't going to work for uh, an ordinary ham. They don't have six of the same radios. <clears throat> I need the version where each one comes with its own charger. They said, well, we have that too. We have six pack of that. 
And so I said, sure, send it to me. I think I said, send me one. They sent me a box. When I opened it up, there were six in there. So I don't know. I, it was, I mean, this was a special. They didn't last a real long time. But the radios were less than 20 bucks a piece. And I tested them like I do uh, the radios. Uh, tested them for the harmonic content and all that sort of thing. Found them to be good. Found the voice quality to be satisfactory. <coughs> and it's very interesting. There's two ways you can program them. You can program them. You can, in fact, control the entire radio from your cell phone okay, uh, or computer, and this is really interesting, Chirp supports this radio. So um, I found it easy to do with Chirp. I tried to get the telephone thing working and, and couldn't, and they said this was a new product, and so they had some, some uh, bugs to iron out, but uh, it seems to be a a pretty good deal. So anyway, I'm going to give away one more of those. I've got three left. One I'm keeping, and the other two are going to my ham club uh, as giveaways for the Christmas party, which is coming up here. Um, we have a very active president, Kathy, um, who is really bringing people into the club. And so we're having a good... Uh, Good meetings. Um, I gave the presentation last Friday without the tooth. That was fun. I gave the same as one of the presentations I gave out at Pacificon, which was the equivalent of that video, two videos actually, that I did on electromagnetic pulse. Okay. Um, he said, uh, LKDUB269 says, loved the dipole video. Yeah, there are some uh, who thought otherwise. They can't possibly be the case. There must be some effect. After all, the first rule of antennas is that everything affects everything, right? But this little extra wrap back of insulated wire seems to be a kind of exception to the rule. And I had the graphs to prove it. Uh, I used the little um, tiny VNA, um, which works with the computer very well. It has very beautiful graphics showing the SWR curve across whatever region you want it. And basically, uh, I built the dipole too long. And this is with insulated wire. And I wrapped back the amount that needed to be so we had a tuned dipole for 40 meters. And then I went out there and clipped off, actually my assistant did, went out there and clipped off the part that had been wrapped back and we got the identical results with the VNA as far as SWR and all that. It was amazing. It was like, wow, you know, if you wrap back wire, bare wire, um, you're shorting it to the wire. So it's just kind of a little thicker wire there. Um, but with the insulated, it's not actually shorting, but it still seems to be working. It's so close to the other wire that it just seems to reinforce what that wire is doing. Okay. And Ray Aguiar says, um, four thumbs up, everyone, please, from KE4YAF. And um, Andy Cowley, hi, all. Donnie King, hello from Tennessee. Donnie, KK4EKK, this ADHD life. Oh, wow, you got a new chair. Yes, I got a new chair. This is a new chair. Um, the old chair was great. It would rock back, but it would also go from side to side. And I finally got just so tired of it, and I tried several times to find out what was going on 
with the chair and couldn't. And so I went down to Home Depot and found a chair that it seemed to me would work well here. It had two requirements. One, that I can lean back. Two, that I can swivel. Three, that it's not very heavy. Four, that I can bring it right up to the desk if I'm doing something here. And that gives us, it gives me this chair. It's got these uh, weird armrests that come up like this. It's technically, well, from a marketing point of view, it's a gaming chair. Uh, but I do have a new chair, yes. Thank you. Well, let's see. Got a new chair, yeah. Richard Myers, good evening from South Daytona, Florida. 60 degrees. You poor souls. It's uh, 36 here. 65% humidity. Glenn Martin from far west Missouri. 33 degrees. 36% relative humidity from N0QFT. Ray, Ray Aguiar. Dave, thank you for pronouncing my last name correctly. I'm, I'm guessing from my days in California where we had far more Hispanic neighbors. I'm glad I got it right. Glenn Martin, have a good Thanksgiving. N0QFT. Trans spam a lot. <laughs> you know, uh, spam is, of course, canned meat. Um, there are multiple conspiracy theories on what is actually in the can. Um, it was originally supposed to be spiced ham, uh, but it's got other meats in it now. It was used extensively in World War II as part of the American rations because you could slice it and then fry it. Now, what happened was in the Polynesian part of the Pacific, which is a huge, huge, huge area, including Hawaii, spam is considered a delicacy and they love it. It's a staple. They're cooking it all the time. And uh, we have the missionaries over from our church quite, uh, you know, once a month or so to feed them. And uh, we have had missionaries who come from Tonga or Hawaii or someplace like that. And I always ask them, do you want to have spam? And they all just, yeah! <laughs> I guess there must be a million recipes for cooking Spam. I mean, it it's still out there, and it's still mystery meat, but it's really popular. I mean, a main dish kind of thing in uh, Polynesia, which is a major part of the Pacific. Filipinos are not Polynesians, but um, they're close, more closely related to Indonesians than and South, South Asia there. Um, but you go over to like Johnson Island or um, Tuvalu or some of these other places and they're, they're the Polynesians. There's this one country, I think it might be Tuvalu, but maybe you can correct me if I'm wrong here. There's a country that at high tide the highest point in the country is three feet above sea level. And the government is already making arrangements to basically move the country somewhere else uh, because of the impending sea level rises. If the Thwaites Glacier in Antarctica breaks loose. It's over land right now, and it's hung up on a great big giant rock outcrop, is what's keeping it from slipping into the sea. If that were to go into the sea, it would raise sea level several feet worldwide. Um, the greenhouse, no, I'm sorry, Greenland, the Greenland glaciers are turning out to be not as much of a problem as they thought they were. Because they are melting like crazy, but it's there's not as much water in there as they thought there was. Now, 
Arctic ice is floating ice. So if you take a glass and put an ice cube in there and then mark the level of the water, as the ice cube melts, it will not change the level of the water because ice, when it freezes, becomes bigger and so therefore less dense and so it rises to the top of the water. And so even though we've had a lot of ice melting, the poor polar bears are in deep trouble because they would go out on those ice flows, hunt seals and stuff like that, and they can't do it anymore, and, and the polar bear population is plummeting. But that ice is not an issue. The ice down in, in Antarctica is an issue because it's mostly on land. And if it does, and glaciers, remember, move. Ice is a fluid, and they move, and they come down into the water. But anyway, okay, let's see. Um, enough on that, but, th but that, that, that country has already made arrangements for where, to, I mean, they got like 70,000 people. So they've already made some arrangements as to what they can do. They're going to like buy an island from somebody else or do something so that they have a place to uh, put their people. Okay, um, spam, yes. <laughs> of course, we know spam is unwanted mail. And it was called spam because it was unwanted commercial email and the people who were running the internet at the time unfortunately used the spam as something that was not liked not liked whereas it turns out there's a big hunk of humanity that really loves it but nowadays of course spam is I bet a lot of people don't know today that you can go to the grocery store and buy a can of spam. And normally you just get it on your email. I had a problem yesterday where I clicked on something. I was trying to look at Cubex and somehow I got a piece of adware stuck in Google Chrome. And I had to go in and basically zap my entire history and delete everything out of Chrome as though Chrome were a fresh copy uh, and that got rid of it but I was embarrassed that I did that because I should not have fallen for it it was uh, adware for um, McAfee and McAfee is a reputable company and McAfee would not advertise with adware. Basically, they were just plastering it all over everywhere. And it says, you have a virus, you need to pay such and such to get McAfee. And I'm going, no, that money would not be going to McAfee. It'd be going to these, these uh, thieves that get things like that. Okay, Dave, I made my first CW contact last November. And exactly one year later, I ragged you at 15 words per minute, contested 18 words per minute, and just confirmed worked all states on CW. Well, Domino Storm, congratulations to you. That's quite an achievement and one that you can be very proud of. And I'm delighted that you were able to do that. Uh, Harry uh, Pepperdy says, I've been watching you for a long time. Great channel. I learn a lot downside. Is very late here. Yes, it's uh, <clears throat> two thirty-one in London in the morning. Two thirty-one in the morning. My wife and I love British murder mysteries. I don't know why. I think BBC just makes better programming than Hollywood. But um, thank you, Bill Myers, K A A G I M. Hi, Dave. Have you thought any more? about a weekly live stream where you give us an opportunity to have a CUSO with you. Oh, I need to do that, don't I? This um, 
holiday season would be a great time to try that. Now, since this setup right here allows you to provide chat revenue to me, it's a money-making endeavor. If you want to add some chat revenue, like you go down into the chat spot and there's a, a bubble with a dollar sign, you can click on that and add, you know, five bucks, ten bucks, whatever you want to. Uh, what I would have to do is to make that net stand alone. Okay, so uh, we wouldn't be conducting any business on the net. We'd just be having fun, and that's great. And I'd, I'd like to do that. We'll have to try that. Now, the problem with weekends is the contests. There seems to be a contest every weekend. But we can try something. Um, sunspots are still going to get better for about another year before they peak. So, uh, you know, I'm going to make a note here. Not that I can read it, but I'll remember what the hen scratching means. Uh, net for Uggies. Sometimes when I get on, I'll call CQ, and the third or third, fourth person that comes back to me is an Augie and knows who I am. And uh, it's, it's quite nice. Okay. Um, <clears throat> LK Dubs 269 um, is getting great results. He has an SWR 0.2, which is a good match. And it's actually an excellent match. David AC3HT, can you briefly talk about Whisper? It's amazing how far 200 milliwatts can travel around the world. Yes. Um, it may surprise you to know. If any of you have Dish Network or whatever the, the competitor to that is, I think they're one company now, um, they have a satellite in geostationary orbit has lots of channels, very broad bandwidth. All the channels that are being broadcast down to Earth come through one antenna. There might be a few little antennas for South America or something, but normally it's a, a North American market. The, um, and they're in geostationary orbit, and the transmitter on that thing. All the data that's mixed together and sent out that transmitter is a grand total of 50 watts. 50 watts. That's like a light bulb 23,000 miles away that's giving you enough light to paint your television screen. And, oh, by the way, the audio with it. And the way that works is the gain, there's, it's a high gain antenna, okay, on the satellite. It just points at North America. There is um, your dish. It's a dish network. You've got a dish. That dish, which works, I think, about 18 gigahertz, um, something that's really high up there, has a huge amount of gain, an enormous amount of gain. Here is a little factoid that took me a long time to accept. I had always been of the opinion that antenna gain had something to do with the capture area, that you would spray the earth with a signal and how much energy you had depended on how much of it you captured. That is not true. And I remember in my graduate work when this was presented to me, I, I, all my intuition just raged against this factoid. And so I went through the equations, the gain equations, for satellite antennas, for satellite links, which is what I kind of focused on on my um, 
graduate study. The gain equation, no matter how hard you work on it, there's a bunch of stuff in the numerator and a bunch of stuff in the denominator. And in the denominator is a lambda. And you can't get rid of it no matter how hard you try. There's always a lambda there in the denominator. Now, lambda is the wavelength. It'd be uh, frequency if you put it in the numerator. But basically, as the frequency goes up, the wavelength goes down. And since it's in the denominator, that makes the gain go up. So a satellite this size at 18 gigahertz will give you as much or more gain as a six-foot dish at S-band. And now here's a little factoid for you. A 20-meter dipole is half the size of a 40-meter dipole. And yet, they have the identical gain. A dipole is a dipole is a dipole. It doesn't matter what band it's on. It gets the same amount of power out of the airwaves to send to your radio. And that's why when you learn, listen on 20 meters or 40 meters or 10 meters, 17, whatever, all the antennas work like. Okay? The gain pattern for a 20 meter dipole and a 10 meter dipole are identical if they're both at one half wavelength. Okay? Now, does that absolutely blow your mind? It absolutely blew my poor undergraduate mind. And I had to prove to myself, and it took me days to do this, crawling through those equations. I said, I'm somehow going to get rid of that lambda. It's going to cancel out. No, it doesn't. So, um, don't think of the gain of an antenna in terms of how much capture area it has. Because you'd think a 160 meter antenna would pick up more raw power than a 10 meter dipole, but that's not true. They pick up the same amount of power, other things being equal. The 160 meter antenna being a half wavelength high and the 10 meter dipole being a half wavelength high, okay? they collect the identical amount of power. And that is one of the weirdisms of radio that makes it so fun. And that's the reason that you can point an 18-inch piece of metal at a dish satellite, receive 200 channels, most of them in HD, not to mention all the music and the the sporting stuff and all the kinds of stuff that they do like that uh, is because of that fact. They do it at a higher frequency, you need a smaller antenna. And while you're making it smaller, don't make it too much smaller so you can actually get a lot more gain out of those things. It was like 30 or 35 dB, if I remember right. Now, that means that antenna needs to be pointed very narrowly, okay, which it is. Works very well. Okay, let's go up here. Um, can you briefly talk about Whisper? Yes. The thing about Whisper is, remember I talked about that 50-watt transmitter up there and nothing down here, okay, except a big antenna. Um... The guy who invented Whisper, uh, who was uh, Joe Taylor, uh, a Nobel Prize winner, who did work on quasars, and to that means radio astronomy. 
So he wanted to make his radios as absolutely sensitive as he could. And what they do to do this is something called noise figure, uh, which is the amount of noise added by the front end of a radio. I know on my Tentac Jupiter, they claim the noise figure is 11 dB. I measured it one time at 13 dB. So they were a little off. I've never measured the ICOM. It's a complicated thing to measure. But it's how much noise the receiver adds just by being there. Well, he can't handle an 11 dB noise figure for his observations of quasars. So he cools the, he puts the preamp right at the feed horn and then cools it to near absolute zero. So now he's dealing with the noise figure of like 0.01 dB. Very, very low noise figure. And he has learned ways of convolving signals such that you can pull out the signal and reject the noise. And that's what he has done with Whisper and with FT8 and JT65 and all that. As you know, in FT8 it takes 50 15 seconds to send 13 bytes of information. Okay? That's because most of what is being sent is redundant. Deliberately redundant. Redundant in a certain way. It's a forward error correction code so that you send instead of those 13 bytes of information, you send hundreds and hundreds of bits very, very quickly. And the way they do that is by frequency shift. And here's another weird one for you. Are ready for this? According to Shannon, Shannon was, Claude Shannon was a Bell Labs scientist who figured this out around World War II time. He figured out what's called an existence proof, um, saying that if you have a channel with a certain bandwidth, okay, 500 hertz, okay, whatever, you can get a certain amount of data bits through that channel with any certainty that you want, regardless of how noisy the channel is. Now, there is an interplay between the noise and the channel bandwidth, but by and large, so if you've got 500 bits per second channel, and you've got a 500 hertz Y, that's one bit per hertz, okay? And if you have a little bit of noise, bam, you lose something, okay? Now, what he's saying, now get this, he is saying that if you code it right with enough forward error correction, you can still get 500 bits per second through that channel. Now, in order to get all those extra bits through there, you might be transmitting it 2 million bits per second to where you would have you know, instead of one bit per baud, you'd have like 20 bits per baud or 50 bits per baud. And he says, there, he says, there exists a code that will allow you to code the signal such that you will get the desired error rate. Now, it came along to uh, another group of people, a guy in Holland, plus I think a couple, couple guys in uh, India, proved a theorem, proved the same theorem, but instead of an existence proof, they created a constructive proof, where they said if you use this algorithm, you can satisfy Shannon's law. And if the error rate that you want is X, then here's how to construct a code that will give you that error rate. Okay, 
By the way, this is how the modern internet works. The fact that it works at all. Because an HF bit error rate is about 10 to the minus 2. In other words, 1 in every 100 bits is uh, flipped. So what he does is he'll send hundreds of bits. And then when you get it at the other end, he goes through an algorithm that decodes it and pulls out the bits. And the probability that they are correct is very high. Now, you take a, um, a disk drive, terabyte disk drive, that's 10 to the 12th bits, bytes, 10 to the 12 bytes. So 8 times 10 to the 12 bits. Okay, and you can't afford errors on there. You need to detect the errors and correct them. Okay, and you can do that. So that you have like a 99.99% probability that every single bit on that disk is correct. And that's how the modern internet and the modern computing world was built based on this uh, BCD or BCH, Bose Chowdhury Hoquangam. The last guy being the Dutch guy, and I badly mispronounced his name. But that's the kind of stuff I studied in my graduate uh, work. Now, there are many, many different kinds of codes for many, many, many different purposes. Some of them will send you some packet does this. Um, will send you some bits and then some error detection bits. And what you do is you take the bits that you receive, compute the error correction bits, and then compare them with the ones that you've received. And if they compare, you're okay. If they don't, you request a resend. It's called ARQ. Okay. Um, or there are um, codes that can have handle like dropouts. You know, if you lose 100 bits in a row, you can still reconstruct the signal. So there's the ARQ, which is you send, and if it didn't work, you get a knack back. And if it did work, you get an ACK. And the other way is forward error correction, um, where you um, send the data out like in um, Whisper you have very few bits of data, very few. Basically, your call sign, your grid square, and your transmitting power, which you set manually, okay? That's all. And it takes two minutes to send that. Two minutes to send that. And so what you're doing is you're wrapping just a few bits in an extraordinary amount of information. Now what that means is that the power required to accomplish that goes down. The more bits you add, the higher the effective signal to noise ratio is and you can keep going down 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 in the power to where you're well below the noise and the signal will still get through so that's how that works that's a complicated explanation sorry about that but i am an engineer i gotta you know i have a quota for how much engineering I need to act like uh, during the week. So anyway, and Ray Aguiar is not Hispanic, he's Portuguese. Now tell me, um, are you treating Hispanic in the sense of Spain being Hispanic or in the sense of um, usually in the U.S.? Hispanic means, well, it's too broad because it means basically people in Latin America, some of whom are indigenous, 
some of whom are of pure bred Spanish descent, where you get into Brazil, Portuguese descent. And, you know, you got everything in between. Um, from pure Indian up to pure uh, Spanish. And we in America just say Hispanic. So that may be a problematic term for somebody who's Portuguese and would rather just say that they are, you know, I think the best thing to say is I'm an American and just leave it at that. There was a, a line in some movie about Vietnam where some lieutenant colonel asked some kid who had a Russian name or Polish name or something like that, big long name. And the guy asked him, what kind of name is that? And his response was, it's American. Mm, good, yeah. Kessler is actually uh, traced back to Germany. Kessler, uh, from the uh, Carpathian Mountains. That's where the Kessler name came from. And if you go up to uh, Syracuse, New York, you look in the phone book, there's a whole column of Castlers. It's a very rare name, but not in, not in Syracuse. They were early settlers uh, that came before the Revolutionary War and settled that area, spoke German, which, what are you speaking? Deutsch. So they said, oh, you're Dutch. You know, this is another... American thing that ignores important parts of people's culture. Um, but um, it was interesting. My first wife was Chinese. And when she emigrated to the United States, and, and this to me is totally racist, but it's what they had to do back then. She was Li Hoshi. Where Hoshi was her given name, and Lee is the family name. In that part of the world, the family name comes first, and the given name comes after. And you can read a lot philosophically into that. You're Lee first, and then a Hoshi after that. Anyway, she had to adopt a Christian name. And so she, she knew that she was going to have to do this. So they had them all figured out for the kids, and she was Deborah. So anyway, she's, I've been married to Loretta for 25 years, so. Um, anyway, okay. I briefly talked about, well, that was not briefly talking about uh, Whisper, was it? But um, it is amazing what you can do with signal processing these days. And that's what I studied for my graduate work, is just, Absolutely fascinating. Okay, uh, Terence, to Echo Zero, India, Papa, Kilo. Hi, Dave. Hope all is well with you. Yeah, I've got this tooth out. It's just about to the point where I can put my teeth back in, so I'll start sounding my, like myself again. And I'm going to have another tooth out, and then I'll be down to a denture and polydent because I don't have the $10,000 right now to go down to the dentist and say, here, put your blasted implants in and be done with it. So, man, they charge you a lot of money for that. Okay, so, uh, Ray, I'm, I was just kind of curious about that because in America, we have kind of stepped on a lot of sensibilities of original the original settlers. For example, Pete Rose was a baseball player years ago. Most of you remember him. He came from a family from Germany called Rosencrantz. And some ignorant customs official said, what kind of a name is that? I'm going to call you Rose. And it stuck. And, the, you know, the people were so grateful to be here. Oh, if we have to be called Rose, fine, we'll be called Rose. So a lot of names were simplified. Mine was K-E-S-S-L-E-R originally. And then at the time of the Revolutionary War, 
The Germans did not want to appear German because the British were hiring German mercenaries. And so they changed the name to Kassler, C-A-S-L-E-R. And that was in the 1700s, and it's been Kassler ever since. So it's amazing. Okay, uh, Muck Rake Prospecting. Good evening from Minnesota. Minnesota. It's a tad nippy out there, like 20. Hope you all stay warm. And Austin, Minnesota has the Spam Plant. If you need to tour it, oh, what fun that would be. Maybe you can sneak in and find out what they really put in it. Um, spam, it's amazing on cheese and crackers. I'll have to try it. Ray says Spam is awesome. Um, prospecting sounds like the Netherlands. Okay, hey, it is the Metaverse cover. All right. Now, after one year, I'm working on copying W1AW's code bulletin at 18 words per minute, but can only copy solid for about 60 seconds before a mistake or two. I have almost all but left SSB completely and operate CW 90%. Good for you. Very good. Now, here's the problem you're running into. There is a plateau at 18. There's a plateau at 8. There's a plateau at 12. There's a plateau at 18. And another at about 25. Where it's very hard. The reason it's hard to get past those plateaus is you need to start copying the code differently. For example, when you're a novice at five words per minute, which is, in my opinion, extremely excruciatingly slow. You can go back to your memorized little flashcards and you can dissect them and go a da and a dit that's an n. Okay? Now by the time you get to 13 words a minute, you have to just go to the letter. Go to the letter. Go to the letter. You hear it, you write the letter down. By the way, here's a, a technique trick for you. Uh, I don't believe in head copy. I believe that copying Morse means copying it, writing it down. And in fact, my log books, I use these spiral bound notebooks as log books. And then that way, if I have a CW conversation, it's in the log, literally. So anyway, as you are copying, copy in lowercase cursive. Lowercase cursive. You can write it a lot faster. You don't have to worry about capitalization. And it's so much easier to read because people usually start copying in uppercase, which takes longer to, to figure out. Lowercase cursive. That'll get you part of the way past the 18. The other thing you need to do at 18 is start copying collections of letters. Dot, did it, did it, did is the. Just write the down every time you hear that. And um, you can uh, do other things too where you are um, starting to pick out the short words. Now, at 26 words per minute, you got to copy words, whole words, okay, in order to have any hope of keeping up. It collections of letters. Now, there's something called copying behind. I've never been able to do that because my brain lives entirely in the present. If, for example, I have an email that said that a call, si a call sign is AB6DEF, and I'm going to look it up on QRZ. By the time I get to the QRZ page, I will have forgotten half of that. I have to see both of them at the same time. So I've never learned to copy behind. But copying behind means as the dits go by, there's a little delay line getting down to your hand. You're writing down the correct words, but you're writing them down from a few seconds before. And once you get past that, you're in, man. You, you can do anything you want. But I think you're probably really enjoying that code. 18 words a minute is a good general purpose 
code speed. Now I know the old amateur extra was 20, but that was just to get you past the uh, the plateau at 18. And I found that 15 to 18 words per minute is quite adequate on the CW band. The country I refer to is the Maldives. Thank you for correcting me on that. John Holman, thanks Dave for all your encouragement. Man, go forth and do great things. Dean, KQ4ADJ, greetings to everyone from middle Georgia. I agree with you on the British mysteries. My wife and I watch all the time on BritBox. That's how we do too. Bill Myers has added $10 to the um, cash or chat revenue. And this comes to me via the YouTube payment along with the payment for the ads and stuff like that. And I've noticed that that is really down lately because people aren't watching YouTube anymore. They're getting out. And, you know, during the pandemic, my channel really jumped ahead. But it's coming back down to normal now. I've also dropped down to three videos a week plus a live stream. And so... Um, I got a whole bunch of stuff I need to review. We've got kind of a list worked out. And sometimes I can't get the review videos done. So we'll, we'll do a series of questions or something like that. So uh, Bill Myers, K-A-H-G-I-M, $10, says, thanks, Dave. And you're welcome. Okay. Uh, LKDUB269, 16.4 feet wires, 5 feet above ground, shooting for 23 feet tomorrow. Very good. Terrence just uh, purchased an FTDX-10. Oh, that's a nice radio. That's their, uh, they've, also, they, they've got two radios they came out with. I don't understand how Yesu does this. They seem to be competing with themselves. The FTDX-10 is a little bit more expensive than the FT-10. Uh, 710, is it? I forget which one it is, but it's a, an, another nice radio. The FTDX part means that it's using the same front end for the receiver that they use on their most expensive radios. Like I have an FTDX 3000 that just has a single receiver in it. If you go to the 5000, you get the double receiver. Of course, they don't make these anymore. But I gotta tell you, I know I love my ICOM, but that Yesu has the best receiver I have ever used. So, no sound, should be sound. I did not know that about dipoles. What is better, GT5R or UV5R? The GT5R. Uh, I did a, a video about that. The UV5R is terrible as far as the cleanliness of its transmission. It's, you're putting a lot of power out on the harmonics and it's way outside FCC specs. But the GT5R, they seem to have cleaned up their act on that one and I reviewed it. And uh, they're, they're a little more expensive but they're much better radios. Okay, um, you might mention the gain of a dish used for receive uh, it depends on the size of the dish, parabolic dish, the size of the dish, the percentage of that which is actually sprayed by the feed horn. Because the feed horn may not reach all the way out to the edge. So you've got that percentage to worry about. It's an antenna, therefore it has side lobes. Remember... It's not just particles. This things behave as waves. And so it'll have a back wave and have side lobes and so on. Um, but uh, you can get 30 dB out of one of these things. I mean, it's phenomenal. But then you've got to point it very carefully. Uh, let's see. You're on now. Okay. Enjoying the live chat as always. BE3GUE. Thank you. That's a better error correction rate than CW. Oh, yes, it is. Yes, it is. PSK31, which was the first of the real, I'll call it the first generation of the real digital modes, 
was PSK-31. And it had a phenomenally good signal-to-noise ratio and extremely narrow bandwidth. And you could type on it about 50 to 60 words a minute. I think about 50. Um, Yegor Matsika. Uh, happy Thanksgiving as well. How is your tooth? It's just about healed enough that I could put my upper dentures in. But then in a couple weeks, I get another one out. So, you know, yeah. Okay, El Juano says, Got a split, senor. Happy Thanksgiving. And you too. Yegor, I hope you are well. I am. Uh, David AC3HT added $20 to the chat revenue. It says, Dave, thanks for the live stream. Always enjoy the informational content. Uh, best wishes, Dave, from AC3HT. Thank you. Tim Holtzclaw, happy Thanksgiving to everyone from KO4HEK. TC Fitz, W6TCF, added $20 to the chat revenue. It says, happy Thursday. Alan Paler says, uh, good evening and happy Thanksgiving to all. From KB8RXY, best wishes. Mark, K5YAC, adds $10 to the chat revenue and says, thanks, Dave, and happy holidays to you. Thank you very much, Mark, and happy holidays to everyone here, too. Now, this is Christopher McKellar, WB7ATO. My first time here, enjoying. Thanks for your work. Now, um, for those of you who are new for the first time, what we do in the chat is just that chat. Um, this is the live stream. This is a chance for you to ask questions in real time. And I'll try to answer them. If I can't answer them, I'll make a note um, and try to address it in a video or in the column. Ask Dave Column in QST. Um, by the way, I filled up my Jeep the other day and it went over not only the price for uh, a tank of gas, but the tank, the price for the tank of gas went not only the membership in QST, but the 25 bucks for the hard copy of QST. So if you don't want to join the league because of the cost, think of it. It's a tank of gas. Okay, we can do that. And P. Bauer 357 added $1.99. Thank you very much. And this was P. Bauer's first um, super chat on a live stream. Thank you very much uh, for doing that. It's the very first time he's contributed to the chat revenue. So it, uh, it really helps out. It really does. Now let's see. Bill Myers, uh, best wishes to Dave and all Augies. I'm hopeful that you can do a live stream where we can make contact on amateur radio. KE0OG in my logbook is a bucket list item. Uh, happy Thanksgiving to you and yours. Well, we'll have to see what we can arrange. Hopefully, my assistant will be back tomorrow. He was not here Monday, and he was going to spend Thanksgiving in Utah. And frankly, I don't know how he can get back tomorrow. But maybe he'll be willing to work Saturday, certainly Monday, uh, so we can clear up this backlog that we have here. We have enough videos to go well into December. But what we do is, as we make videos, we'll juggle them around so that what I think are the more important videos uh, come first and, uh, and so on. As we're trying hard to uh, make our uh, channel, you know, improve the production values. By the way, for those of you who asked last week, um, not this past Sunday, but the Sunday before, I started my other channel. And, of course, it was very first time, so um, I think I got 68 views, but I got 100% likes. And um, you'll see down at the bottom of all my Ask Dave videos in gray down there is just a, a little link 
to the other channel. I'm trying very hard to keep the two channels separate because they exist for separate purposes. This one is ham radio. Let's keep it ham radio. Let's see. Um, old dog BBQ. I'm working toward general. Should I really go further? I'm only interested in HF. What I recommend to people is that they keep working till they get their general. And then set up an HF station. Use it for two years. Learn about HF. Learn what the bands sound like. Learn what DX is. Learn what a contest is like. All of these kinds of things like that. So you get to the point where you're confident on HF. And then go for your extra. I have seen too many people go from zero to extra in one sitting. And almost universally, these people disappear after a few weeks. They've made, they achieved their goal. They got their ham license. But the goal, in my opinion, and the way I put my licensing videos together, which the league is using as their videos, the way I put those videos together is I don't want to create just another ham licensee. I don't want to create licensees. I want to create hams. People who get on the air, enjoy it, love the radios, love to talk about it. All the many dark alleys you can explore with ham radio, whether it's just plain shortwave listening or microwave or moon bounce or satellite work or, you know, gray line on an early morning or um, bouncing signals off of the ionosphere, whatever it may be. There's so many things you can do with ham radio. So, yes, you should. Uh, go get your general. Have you looked at digital voice HF projects? Free DV is one I ran across today. Are there others? Free DV is the one that I know about. And as near as I can tell, there's a modem involved, which is not free. So, I don't know. I may completely misunderstand it. I talked to some people at Pacificon who were pushing free DV, and I didn't have very much time to talk to them. So, I'll have to look into it a little bit more. But yes, HF, Digital Voice, is there. It's not really a thing yet, but it is there. CW, this is Mark K5YAC. CW is indeed a super fun mode. My code is rusty and has slowed considerably as I've been off the air for a bit. But I hope to get it going. So rewarding and fun. The best way to increase your CW competency, bar none, is to get on the air. Now, you will find slow code on the 40 meter band about 706 and 7110 are kind of the two places for slow code. And so it's a good place to go to get on the air. And the thing is, you can't just push it away when you're in the middle of QSO. It forces you to finish it out, you know. And you can always guess and a lot of things. You know, when I took my extra code test, which was 20 words per minute, you could do it two ways. Answer a multiple choice test, 10 questions, or get, what is it, 100 characters in a row accurate. And my copy was real junk. I definitely couldn't do that, but I passed the uh, written exam because I had done so much CW in the past, I knew when to concentrate. Like I knew when a signal report was coming. And so I'd get the poise to send it two or three times. I'll just grab it once. That's all I need, 579. And, you know, they're going to tell you what your rig is. So I can pick out ICOM, Kenwood, Yesu, 
whatever, you know, I'm poised to pick it out. And you can do the same things with the CW and not worry too much about the details. So, um, don't get good at CW to get on the air. Get on the air to get good. Yes, that is true. That is absolutely true. Okay, we're out of time. We're over time. Thank you so much. A happy Thanksgiving to you wherever you are in the world. I know it's an American holiday, but this is the one time when the nation actually pauses to give thanks. And um, talk about happy things. Happy memories. Happy friends, happy family. So a happy Thanksgiving to all of you. And until we next meet, 73.